I'm going to read a few verses from the Bible, and they are some of the most disturbing to me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And the same verses in another translation. Not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. At the judgment, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we told others about you and used your name to cast out demons and to do many other great miracles. But I will reply, you have never been mine. Go away, for your deeds are evil. There are several things that are disturbing to me about these verses. One of them is that there will be some people who call God Lord and who will have done some exploits in his name, but it will end up that the Lord will tell them that he never knew them. Also, he will tell them to depart from him and will call them workers of lawlessness, or in the other translation, will tell them that their deeds are evil. Another thing that is disturbing to me about this is that it says that many people will be in this position. Generally, if a person calls God Lord and is doing exploits or acts in his name, it would seem as if they are really doing the will of God and must be pretty close to him. Yet another disturbing thing about these verses is that apparently it will only seem that way that it will only seem that these people are doing God's will and seem like they are close to him, when in fact they are not. What makes this even more troubling is that perhaps it seemed to them, too, that they were really doing the will of God and must be pretty close to him, when in fact they were not. When I read these verses in the past, I thought, wow, I don't want to be one of the people who will call God Lord and do things in his name, but will be told that he never knew me and to depart from him, that would be terrible beyond comprehension to me. I began to pray to the Lord that I would not be one of those many people. What about these exploits these many people would have done? These verses list prophesying, driving out demons, telling other people about God, and performing miracles. Those seem like godly acts to me. Nevertheless, these verses show that even acts like this can be outside of the will of God. I do not think it is limited to prophesying, driving out demons, telling others about God, or performing miracles either. I think the godly acts that can possibly be done outside of the will of God could also include preaching and teaching. Well then, how do we keep from being one of the many people mentioned in these verses? I suppose different people have different answers to that question. It may be as simple as these many people mentioned in the verses were not saved at all, as it says that God will say to them that he never knew them. In the other translation, it says that God will say to them that they have never been his. I suppose a person could stop there and say that these many people were simply not saved at all. I believe there is something more to learn from these verses, something that we as believers can learn and benefit from. First of all, these verses say that not everyone who calls God Lord and who sound religious are really godly people. I imagine that most of you already know this. I will probably come off as cynical in saying this, but spend a little time around supposed Christians and you will find that out for yourself. 
If you do not already know that not everyone who calls God Lord and who sound religious are godly people, that's okay. Now you do. Not everyone who calls God Lord and who sound religious and who even do exploits in his name are godly people. Okay, so look at what these verses say the distinguishing factor is. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And the second translation says, Not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. The distinguishing factor is if a person does the will of God. The distinguishing factor is if a person does the will of God, not if they call him Lord, or if they do those godly exploits. What I gather from this is that all those exploits a person can do in God's name can possibly be done outside of the will of God. Is that a bold thing to say? It seems very clear to me that that is one of several points these verses are communicating. I believe there is something very important to learn here, and I will try to share with you what that is. And I will start with reading these verses about Jesus. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. So Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself unless he sees the Father doing it. For whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Then, midway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when he hasn't been trained? They asked. So Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. By these verses I learn that Jesus did what He saw the Father doing, and spoke what the Father told Him to. He did not do or speak things on His own. If Jesus Himself did not do these things on His own, I do not think we should be doing these things on our own either, by our own initiative. We are to be led by God, by the Holy Spirit. You can see for yourself many instances, especially in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well, examples of how people were led by the Holy Spirit to speak this or do that or go here or go there. They were inspired and motivated led by the Holy Spirit to do what they did. The Bible itself was inspired by God. It was not people on their own initiative alone deciding to write about historical events and interesting stories and then put them in a book. It is important that we are led by the Holy Spirit in general, but also in the works or acts we do in God's name. These many people mentioned in those verses will be called workers of lawlessness. Lawlessness, it seems to me, addresses the fact that they are working outside of the proper authority, namely, the proper authority and authorization from God. They did these acts on their own initiative. They did not wait to see what God wanted to do. They were not led by Him. Imagine for a moment a diplomat or a representative of some country this diplomat goes to visit another country to talk over various matters. Imagine this diplomat deciding to push issues or say things to the officials in this country they are visiting on his own initiative without being authorized by the country he represents. Imagine that on his own he is deciding what the country he is supposed to represent wants to do when in fact his boss back home did not authorize him to do any of that. Would that not be out of order? He's supposed to follow some kind of orders or plan, not just decide on his own what to do. 
I said he was supposed to follow some kind of orders or plan. Notice the verb follow. Over and over again in the Bible, Jesus said to follow him. What does that mean? Again, I think different people will give different answers to that question. If their answers are different from mine, that's okay. We all see in part, do we not? What I see in Jesus saying to follow him is follow his example, but also follow him like he was following the lead of his father in what he did and in what he said, to follow the Holy Spirit which he gave to us, to follow God by the leading of the Holy Spirit. I have done a little dancing in my life as a hobby. I bring that up because I've noticed that the way you lead or follow in dancing is an excellent example of how the Holy Spirit leads and how we are to follow. Typically, the man leads in dancing. He gives cues to his partner as to how they are going to move. A good partner will follow his cues. In my experience, dancing does not work out so well if both partners want to lead. Actually, that's an understatement. It's not that it doesn't work out so well. It just doesn't work if both partners want to lead. There have been times when I have led my dance partner, which is not what I prefer, but I did so because they did not know what to do. Personally, I find it much easier and enjoyable to follow a good lead. For me, it takes the thinking out of it, and all I have to do is follow the cues from my partner, and that is fun for me. The leader is the one that has to think of what is going to be danced next. It's the same way when you're following the lead of the Holy Spirit. I don't have to know the next move or where exactly we are going. To be real, often I do not know what to do or say, so I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit's lead. He knows what to say and what to do. My part is to obey each cue, and to me that is much easier than being the leader. I don't want to be the leader, I want to follow. And I want to follow him above what might be going on around me that my mind wants to latch onto and follow above him. For example, I have danced with a partner where he was leading very much off the beat of the music that was playing. Now, I could choose to either follow his lead even though it wasn't in step to the music, or I could ignore his cues and stick to the beat of the music. It wasn't the easiest thing to ignore the music and follow him, because part of me wanted to move to the beat, but I did follow him. We danced off beat, but I was following him. I was following his cues, regardless of the music that my mind wanted to latch onto and follow instead of him. I have enough of an ear for music to recognize the beat, so it was strange to be dancing off beat, but I submitted to my partner's cues. I knew my partner did not know he was off beat, so I just danced to his lead and disregarded the fact that it was not quite right because it wasn't in step to the music. I have not always been able to rely on having a good leader in dancing. However, in contrast, God is perfect in his lead every time. He knows what to do, when to do it, and how. He knows best, so I want to follow him. I can rely on him. I want to follow his cues, even if it is offbeat, so to speak to what makes sense to my human mind. Don't you think it was offbeat and nonsensical to the human mind when Jesus made mud with his own spit and then put it on the blind man's eyes? Nevertheless, Jesus followed what he saw the Father do. The outcome was a miracle. I do hope I can get better at setting aside what makes sense to my mind when I am to move in faith and follow God's lead. 
Maybe one of the most disturbing things about those verses I opened with is that it says many. Many people. Not a few, but many. With that kind of quantity mentioned, I think this is one of the main problems with the church. That many are not being led by the Spirit. They are being led by themselves, or perhaps other people, or perhaps by obligations or tradition. When churches are not being led by the Spirit, but instead by man or by traditions, the result is not good. It results in staleness. A staleness more stale than bread that is a year old. It's dry. Staleness, and really a stifling of what the Spirit would like to do. When churches are led by the Spirit of God, it is fresh. That is how I describe it, anyway. It is fresh. There is living water to be had. There is life and liberty. Not man-made restrictions and this air of rigid religiosity and wanting to please man, or fear man, or maybe both. Sadly, I think a lot of Christians fear man more than they fear God. The difference between a man-led and spirit-led church is huge, and it is noticeable for anyone with one eye open, even if they cannot quite put their finger on what the difference is. The awareness, knowledge, and understanding of letting and wanting God to lead is so valuable. It is imperative, absolutely necessary, and the majority of God's people are unaware of this. Unaware of something absolutely necessary. You can count on God, depend on Him, and He wants you to. The important thing is that He is leading, and then one follows Him, and counts on Him, and depends on Him. If a person is leading, moving out on their own, without Him leading, and without His approval, then it is different. It is not that God would abandon them, but they should not expect God to sanction their own actions as if he were leading it. It's not the same, but many go before God, expecting him to be on board. It should really be that God goes before them, and they get on board with him. There is a definite difference here, an important difference. There is a safety in his will, an assurance but not outside of his will. And you know, it can be like this. Not everyone can accept this, but some acts, the same acts, can at times be in his will, and sometimes not, depending on the situation and timing. That is why it is important to rely on the Holy Spirit and his leading at any given time. For example, speaking. There are times when it is in God's will that one should speak. There are other times when it is in God's will that one should not speak. That is only one example, but I hope you see what I'm saying. Not everyone proclaiming God's name is following his spirit. Many do not know what that means, thinking any and every time God's name is proclaimed that it is his perfect will. I'm wondering how I can say what I'm about to say tactfully. I knew of a man who was very evangelistic in nature, sharing the gospel with everyone he came in contact with anywhere he went. Truly, everyone and everywhere and any time and all the time. It seemed that other Christians that knew him admired this trait of his wishing that they too could be so bold in sharing the gospel. I understand that, but I'm just cautious enough to wonder if he was led by the Holy Spirit in this evangelism or not. I'm also cautious enough that I'm not about to say that he was or wasn't led by the Holy Spirit. I'm simply saying that I wondered about it. Also, I wasn't so quick to wish I was like him, in this manner of evangelizing. I know that personally that is not my highest function in the church body, but my main thought was that I don't wish to be like him just because he preached the gospel to everyone and everywhere at any time. 
My desire is to be led by the Spirit of God in my actions, sharing the gospel at the right time, in the right place, and to the people who, at that time, God would want me to share it with. I would want to wait on being led by the Holy Spirit in doing these things, not led by myself and what I think I should do. I hope you see what I mean. I mean, I could, under my own initiative, go out to some street corner and accost people on the sidewalk and share the gospel with them, but I would not want to do that if that's not what God wanted me to do. I could also go to some seminary school, earn some degree, and be a leader in some church under my own initiative. I could also preach about what's in the Bible under my own initiative. What I'm trying to say is that many seemingly godly works can be done in God's name and have not been led by Him at all. I think that a lot of times people don't need God's name proclaimed at them. A lot of times they don't need to be preached at. They would be reached better by a professing Christian acting like a Christian in their everyday life and letting that shine out as a witness. It is troubling to me to hear certain people speak Bible verses at me, but then I see that they live in a totally different way. This being particularly most evident to those closest to them, like the parents who drag their kids to church on Sunday and act like Christians while they are in public, but then at home towards their children they act let's just say, very differently. Then the child can grow up to despise God and everything related to him because they were smart enough to see this faith meant nothing in the way their parents lived and behaved. The part that is misunderstood is that how God intended a parent to love their child and how God intended faith in him to change a person's life was for whatever reason just not received and submitted to by their parents. So this just distorts the child's view of what Christianity is. I'd rather someone not be able to rattle off Bible verses at me, but actually live how the Bible says to live. I hope you know what I mean. There have been times when someone's behavior is so ungodly, yet in the next breath they start speaking their memorized Bible verses at me, and it grosses me out so bad I don't even want to hear them speak. In fact, don't speak to me Bible verses when by your behavior I see you haven't grasped the most elementary things of the faith. It's gross. At that point, the Bible verse spewing just comes off as manipulation. I think this type of behavior does a lot of damage and can paint true Christians as being two-faced and insincere. If we claim the title of Christian, I hope we really live like one. I got a little off topic, but back to the main message. It is important that God's people follow his lead just as Jesus did. It is clear if one has eyes to see. He's the leader. It is reckless of people to run ahead of him doing things he did not authorize and doing them in his name. And this will be the case for many, as those verses say. Imagine that. Many. It will be revealed on Judgment Day. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Here is a postscript to the main body of this message. It is titled Reciters. I'm not sure how much it relates to the main topic of this message, but I felt like including it here, so I will. Do not worry about those who refuse to see and understand, those who are closed off to the Holy Spirit in deed, even if not in spoken word. They will not outright refute certain passages in the Bible, but they will do so in their actions, stemming from unbelief. They accept all of the Bible, because how could they not? 
but what is truly accepted is shown in the way they live. The devil will recite the Bible if it furthers his objective. So do not be taken in nor worried about the opinions of those who do the same. Recite scripture, but live some other way. They are their own leader if they are not led by the enemy. They are not following the Holy Spirit. They don't know what that means. Their minds are too much in the way, too trusted when God's Spirit is untrusted. They speak of things they do not know, even teach it. One cannot teach what they do not know. They talk about it only, reciting, not really knowing, reciting. Lord willing, I will continue this topic of being led by the Holy Spirit in some future videos. My closing two cents on the topic for now is that if you care about being led by the Holy Spirit and want that, to ask the Lord to teach you how to be led by Him. He is the best teacher.